Get ready for IELTS. Students' book. Copyright HarperCollins Publishers, 2016. Hello. My name is Steve Smith. Could you tell me your full name, please? Thank you. Can you show me your identification, please? I'd now like to ask you some questions about yourself. Tell me about your family. What does your father do? How much time do you spend with your family? Are people in your country close to their family? Do you prefer to go out with your family or your friends? Where do you live at the moment? My father is a doctor. He helps people. He works in a hospital. He's very kind to people. 1. What do you do? 2. How would you describe your family? 3. Who is important to you in your family? OK, everyone. We know the topic is families, but what exactly are we going to talk about? I mean, how are we going to make it interesting? There's all sorts of things we could talk about. We have to choose a particular area. What do you think, Mandy? I think we should concentrate on what makes a successful family. But on the other hand, if we discuss the difference between families around the world, we can make comparisons and show the differences between them. That's a good idea, Edward. It'll give us more to discuss. Right. So the next thing is to decide which cultures we should talk about. I think we need to include Arab culture. Ibrahim knows all about families in the Arab Gulf, and Mona knows about North Africa. They're both very different, I think. What do you think, Mona? Yes, that would be a good start. And then other places. How about somewhere else in Africa? I could talk to David from South Africa. I agree with Mona. Why don't we then talk about families from one Western country? I'm happy with that. I could talk about U.S. families. They're interesting. Right, guys. Let's have a look at what we're going to put in the slides. The first slide's going to be the introduction, isn't it? So, I guess it should have a title. How about Families Around the World? A comparison. Yeah. So, we've got the title. Don't you think we should make a list of bullet points for each of the slides in the presentation? Oh, yes, definitely. How many slides do we have to do? Well, the presentation's ten minutes long, so we should probably have a maximum of six slides. Remember that Mona's already got two slides about South Africa. Well, why don't we do two slides each? That'd be eight, including the introduction and the conclusion. That sounds fair enough. Let's do that. So who's going to do the rest of the slides? I can start off with the introduction, and then I could do the conclusion and the summary at the end. What do you think? Great. I'd like to talk about families in different parts of the world. I know about the Gulf, and can get any other information from you guys. Fine. So I could do a couple of slides showing how families are similar and how they're different. We want the presentation to look as if it's been made by a team, don't we, Edward? I think we should have one design for all the slides. Do you agree? Oh yes, of course. We don't want a different color for each slide. Shall we design a slide now for the rest of the group to use? Yes, let's do that. Let's have a look. This slide has the program icon on the title box. Shall we keep it there? No, I don't think so. It hasn't got anything to do with the presentation. Let's take that off. Fine. And I think we should keep the blue bullet points. They match the light blue title box. What do you think about putting images in each slide? Oh, absolutely. I think we should put at least one image on each slide. Good. We're agreed, then. Let's send this slide to the others, shall we? Okay, everyone. 
I've put all our slides together so we can see if we're happy with the presentation. I think we need to check that we all agree with the order. There's nothing to decide about my slides, the introduction and the conclusion. Obviously, one of my slides goes at the beginning and the other one at the end. Edward's slide comparing the families will have to go after Mona's and Ibrahim's. What we need to decide is the order to talk about them. Well, we don't want the US first. What about the Arabian Gulf, then North Africa, then South Africa? It's logical. I mean, they connect together. What do you think, Mona? Um, I'm not sure about the Gulf first. Why not North Africa? I agree with Ibrahim. Isn't it sensible to connect them all? So start with Arabian Gulf Arab families, link to Arabs in North Africa, and then North Africa links with South Africa, which is the oldest culture anyway. The Gulf Arabs came before they spread to North Africa. And South Africa. I think it's quite new. And the U.S.? Well, Europeans arrived in the 1600s, only 400 years ago. You will hear three students talking to their tutor about the presentation they are planning. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, everyone. So, you're going to tell me about your presentation. First of all, what's your topic? Did you say you were going to talk about the uses of mobile phones? Uh, not exactly. We're actually going to explain the dangers of using mobile phones. Ah, OK. That sounds interesting. What are you going to discuss exactly? Well, we've planned to divide the presentation into three sections. We'll have an introduction explaining why we think it's important to understand the dangers of mobiles. Then, on the second slide, we'll have a list of the different types of danger. And then on the last slide, we're going to suggest ways of staying out of danger when you use a mobile. Yes, we want to start by telling the audience that using a mobile phone can be dangerous and then go into more detail in the next part. OK, but before you talk about the dangers of mobiles, I think you should mention the advantages. You could put that in your introduction. It balances up the argument a bit. Oh, yes. I see what you mean. Right, we'll do that. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 7. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 7. So, shall we have a look at your presentation? Did you bring it with you? I've got it here on a memory stick. Can we show you on your computer? Yes, that's fine. Let's have a look. Hmm. Right. As you say, you're going to add the advantages of using mobile phones to the first slide. Good. Who's going to explain the second slide with all the dangers? That's me. Do you think I've got enough detail? Yes. I think there's plenty of information, but I think it's all a bit mixed up at the moment. I mean, you've got dangers like getting headaches in the same list as having car accidents and being robbed in the street. They're all different types of danger, aren't they? I think you should divide them into groups, maybe under separate titles like health, accidents and security. Oh, right. Yes, thank you. That will make it much clearer to the audience. Mm. OK. Now, in the third slide, you can put your suggestions for staying away from each of these dangers under separate titles. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Have you got any other questions? Um, yes. 
The presentation should be for ten minutes. Is that right? Yes, but ten minutes in total, including three minutes for questions. So you'll only talk for seven minutes. That's only two minutes each. We won't be able to say much in that time at all. That's why you have to plan what you're going to say carefully, and make sure you only include the most important information. For instance, you won't have time to give examples, but you could put some images on your slides that show examples without spending time talking about them. Hey, that's a good idea, and the audience can look at them while we talk. And another thing. Make sure all the slides have the same style. You should get together and agree on one style for the whole presentation. Okay, we'll do that too. Thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of section three. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. One. Fry. Fry. Two. Pray. Pray. Three. Lead. Lead. Four. Blade. Blade. Five. Correct. Correct. Six. Play. Play. Seven. Read. Read. Eight. Fly. Fly. Nine. Played. Played. Ten. Collect. Collect. So, Sally. What do you do in your free time? Well, at the moment, I'm training to be a private pilot. No way! Really? What made you want to do that? Well, I've always loved the idea of flying a plane, ever since I was a little girl. Wow! Isn't it expensive? Uh, yeah, but it's worth it. It's an amazing experience. But what about you, Martin? What do you do for leisure? Nothing nearly as exciting. I play ice hockey in my spare time. I'm captain of the college team, so at weekends we travel to games all over the state. But that sounds fun. Do you enjoy leading the team? Yeah, I do. Hi, Steve. What are you doing? Well, I collect stamps with pictures of tropical birds on them, so I'm looking for more of those. Oh. That's interesting. Which ones have you got so far? I've got a thirty-two cent stamp with a picture of a cardinal honey eater on it. It came out in nineteen ninety-eight. A cardinal honey eater? Is that a bird? Can I see it? Yeah, here. It's a tropical bird. Oh yes, it's beautiful. So, which country is the stamp from? The United States. Hmm. And how did you get it? Do you know someone in the states? No, it's not like that. I buy stamps from other collectors. Look at this one. I bought it last week. It's a twenty-five cent stamp. Oh, brilliant! It's got a parrot on it. When was it issued? Nineteen sixty-seven. Okay. And where's it from? It's from Brazil. Cool. Hi. Can I help you? Are you interested in climbing at all? Hi. Yeah. Actually, I've been thinking about joining a club for a while now. So,、uh, what do I have to do? It's easy, really. I can fill in the form for you right now online, and then you can come to our first meeting next month. Okay. Let's do that then. Right. First of all, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew. And your family name? Metcalf. Metcalf. How do you spell that? M E T C A L F E. M E T C A L F E with an E. Yes, that's right.
And your age? Are you over 18? Yep, I'm 21. And where do you live? My address is 43A Highbury Square, London, W1. Thanks. And do you have a number where I can contact you? Yes, my mobile is 07209 571 324. And I have to ask you a couple more questions. Uh, do you have any health problems? Uh, no, no, nothing. And a last question. Have you ever climbed before? Yes, I have, a bit. Well, thanks very much. You will hear two students talking about university clubs and societies. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, are you the person to ask about joining a club? Yes, I am. What would you like to know? Well, I'm interested in several things, but I'd like to know more about the different clubs and how much they cost. I'm looking for a small club that's not too expensive. OK. Have a look at this table. You can see the names of the clubs, the fees and the number of members. I'm afraid they aren't in any order. If you look at the top of the list, the first club is table tennis. That's one of our new clubs. Oh, right. So the table tennis club costs £20. That's quite expensive. Yes, it is a bit expensive. The cross-country cycling club is cheaper, though. Membership fees are only £15, but on the other hand, it's got 100 members. The film and drama club costs a lot, doesn't it? Yes, £50 is a lot, and that's probably why it only has 12 members. Uh, is there any other club you think looks interesting? Look at the next one, street dance. Have you ever done any street dance? No, I haven't really. It's the cheapest. It only costs five pounds. Mm. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions five to seven. Listen and answer questions five to seven. OK. Shall we start with your interests? What do you like doing best? Um, well, I like photography. I've got a professional camera, so I take it quite seriously. But I can't really imagine belonging to a club to take photographs. I usually go on long walks on my own and take photos. So I like photography, but I wouldn't want to join a club to do it. OK. So what else do you like doing? Running? Oh no, not running. I like walking, but I hate running. I'm afraid the running club isn't for me, or the cycling club. And film and drama? Ah, uh, no. It's far too expensive. But I do like yoga. I've practised yoga on and off for years. How many members does the yoga club have? It's always a small group. A lot of people sign up at the beginning of term, but they stop going after a few weeks so they're left with a few regular members every year. That sounds good. I think I'd like to join the yoga club. And what about the contemporary dance club? Is it expensive? Contemporary dance? No. It's not expensive. Ten pounds for the term. Do you like dance? Well, I've never tried contemporary dance. But I do like jazz and tap dance. How often does the group meet? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So, can I have your full name, please? Victoria Mandeville. M-A-N-D-A-V-I-L? No, no. M -A -N D E V I double L E. Double L E. Thank you. And how old are you? 19. And your address? 57 Berry Gardens, Atherton Park, Manchester, 
M46. How do you spell berry? B E R R Y? No, it's B U R Y. Right. B U R Y. And do you have a contact number? Yes. My mobile is 07942-573-279. 07942-573-279. Yes, that's right. Is that all? Uh, one more thing. Do you have an email address? That is the end of section one. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Now I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. You'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say before you begin talking. You can make some notes if you wish. Here is a pencil and some paper. I'd like you to describe a newspaper or magazine you enjoy reading. You should say what kind of newspaper or magazine it is, which parts of it you read, when and where you read it, and explain why you enjoy reading it. I enjoy reading a magazine called Fab Football. It is about sport, of course, and it's my favourite sport. I love watching football from different countries and I love reading about it. The magazines got lots of good information. I don't like reading the letters or adverts. I prefer reading the interviews with famous players or the news. I read Fab Football every weekend. I buy it on Saturday morning and go home and read. I enjoy meeting friends and reading the magazine together. I don't mind sharing it. We like chatting about the news, the players. It's very interesting. Now I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. You'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say before you begin talking. You can make some notes if you wish. Here is a pencil and some paper. I'd like you to describe an activity that you like doing. You should say what activity it is, when and where you do it, who you like doing it with, and explain why you enjoy doing it. 1. Is it important for a country to have festivals? 2. Are friends more important than family? What is an important festival in your country? What are your favourite parts of this festival? How have special occasions, such as weddings, changed in your country? Do you think special occasions and festivals are important for a society? I'm trying to find out if people from northern countries have the same attitudes to talking to strangers in public as people from southern countries. OK, so what have you found out? Uh, well, I found out that in some countries, it's more common to talk in public than in others. For example, people in the UK and Holland don't usually talk to people they don't know, but the Italians and the Spanish seem to be much more open. They chat to people on buses, in shops, in restaurants. So, do you think that people from the south of Europe are friendlier than northern Europeans? Well, it does look that way, even in the same country. I mean, uh, for example, in comparison with Italians from the north of Italy, the Italians in the south chat much more to each other in public. Hmm, it does sound interesting. 
Well, that's fine. I think you've found a good topic. Hi, Barbara. Why don't you join our group? We're going to give a presentation about what we eat at each meal in our home countries. Oh, great. I love finding out about other cultures. So, where do we start? Breakfast? In the UK, we have cereal, toast, eggs and tea or coffee for breakfast. Have you got that, Mina? Yes, but breakfast in India is completely different. We have a lot of different kinds of breakfast across India, but mostly we eat some type of bread with lentils. Oh, is that right? In China, we have tea with noodles or rice and vegetables for breakfast. So, what do you have for lunch, Barbara? Well, you know, in the UK, we don't usually have a big lunch. We usually just have a sandwich. But it's different in India, isn't it? Oh, definitely. I don't like sandwiches at all. We have rice and vegetables for lunch in India. Yeah, we have a cooked meal at lunchtime too. We usually have noodle soup and a main course. We have our main meal in the evening in the UK as well. Quite often we have chicken, meat or fish with potatoes and vegetables. Hi, Mina. Shall we have a look at the material for our presentation on marriage customs? Yeah, sure. I've got a lot of information about India. How about you? Yes, yes. I've got material about marriage in the Emirates. Shall we get going? What about meeting? How do people in India meet in the first place? Mm, in traditional Indian families, the parents used to arrange the marriage and the couple used to meet for the first time when the boy visited the girl's house. But that's changed now. Yeah, we used to have arranged marriages in the Emirates too. Did the groom have to give anything to the bride's family? I mean, did they give them a gift or money? Well, in India, in the old days, the girl's family used to give the boy's family a gift, like money or jewellery. But it's not allowed anymore. Wow. In my country, the groom still has to pay all the expenses. <laughs> um, have there been any changes in marriage customs in India in recent years? Well, yes. I found an article about special websites for finding partners. It says that because so many young people from India study abroad these days, their families are using websites to find marriage partners for them. Oh, okay. And where does the couple live when they get married? That's another thing that's changing. In the past, the bride used to go to live with the family of the groom. But these days, more and more young couples are setting up their own homes independently. What about the Emirates? You will hear two students discussing a project on international festivals with their tutor. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 and 2. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Good morning. Shall we start by looking at the topic of your project? So, what have you decided to research? Well, we thought we'd compare festivals in different countries and see if any of them are similar. Yeah, you know, like the carnival celebrations in South America and the water festival in Thailand. OK. What exactly are you planning to study? The origins of the festivals? The types of celebration? People's attitudes towards the festivals? We were planning to look at the origins of the festivals and the time of year they're celebrated. We're thinking of looking at the connection between the seasons in different countries and the actual festivals, and then looking for similarities between countries that are quite far apart. Well, that sounds interesting. Did you say you've already started researching into the carnival? Yes. We've already found a connection between the carnival and the seasons. For instance, some researchers say that a very long time ago in Europe, People used to put on colourful masks and costumes at the beginning of the year to celebrate the end of winter. 
and then they could get ready for spring. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 3 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 3 to 5. Right, and then what happened? Well, as the years went by, the purpose of the carnival changed and it became a religious festival. These days there are big carnival celebrations in countries all across the world, like Brazil and India and Indonesia. But an interesting thing we discovered is that in some countries, people celebrate the carnival by throwing water at each other in the street. Well, we thought that, obviously, this is because carnivals celebrated at the hottest time of the year, just before the rainy season. So, splashing people with water is a very good way of cooling them down. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Hmm, yes, that makes sense. Um, did you look into any other festivals? Yes, we did. What we're planning to do is more research into water festivals. We found that in Asian countries, where there aren't any carnival celebrations, there are still festivals that involve people splashing each other with water. Actually, we found references to them in Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, China and Japan. But we also found a reference to a water festival in Mexico. So we thought we'd look into that a bit more and see if we can find any similarities between these countries. Uh, I mean, we realise that water is more than just a way of cooling people down in hot weather. It also has a lot of different religious meanings and purposes. For instance, we found that in some societies, water can mean life, or wealth, or just luck. Yes, and another thing we found out is that these water festivals often celebrate the beginning of the new year, just like the original celebrations hundreds of years ago before the carnival. So, um, up to now, we found that the carnival and the seasons are linked by ancient traditions, and that water plays an important part in the celebrations. That is the end of section 3. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Yes, I like the capital city. I like this very much. I live in the capital city. I know it very well. It is in the north of my country. It is very nice. It's got lots of business and lots of tourists. There's a beach in the city, and you can see mountains. People shop in the city, and people work in the city. I like it, because it's my hometown. It is clean, it is modern. I like living there. A. I'm a student. I'm studying business. B. In my country, I see my family every day. We all live together. In London, it is impossible. I see my uncle sometimes. C. There are many jobs. People can work in factories, schools or offices. There are lots of international businesses too. D. The subject is very interesting. I want a good job in my country, and I can get a promotion with this qualification. The exams are difficult, but I'm improving. E. It's okay. It's the same as other countries, I think. F. Beijing is in the north of China. G. No. There is a problem with traffic. The roads are always busy and pollution is bad. 1. Hey, Tony. Where are you going? I'm just going over to the sports centre.
Oh, really? Oh, I've never been there. Where is it? Oh, it's not far. Go down the path on the left, and the sports centre is on the other side of the wood. Two. Um, excuse me, Susie. Could you help me? Yes, of course. What is it? I've got a lecture in the law school next. Could you tell me where the lecture theatre is? Oh yes, that's easy. The law lecture theatre's on the first floor. Three. It's a lovely campus, isn't it? The lake's so pretty. What's that building on the other side? Oh, that's the business school. So how do you get there? You just follow the footpath round the lake. Four. Hi, Susie. Are you going to the theatre by any chance? Well, I'm not going there, but I can tell you where it is. Look over there. That's the theatre, just across the green. Oh, okay. Thanks a lot. See you later. Five. Uh, Tony, I have got to go into the city centre. Where can I get the bus? Well. The nearest bus stop is just across the road from the student union building. Six. Hey, Susie, can you tell me where the bank is? I want to get some cash out. I've just realised I still owe you ten pounds. Oh, okay. Go along to the end of the path until you get to the shop on the corner. Turn left, and the bank's right next door. Hey, Sandra, how's it going? What do you think of the campus? I think it's all fantastic. Have you been to the coffee shop in the library yet? No, I haven't. Where is it? It's on the ground floor. You know, you can have a break without actually leaving the library. It's really great to meet your friends there. Yeah, that's an excellent idea, and it means you've got somewhere to chat without upsetting people who want to study. I can't concentrate when other people are talking. I usually go upstairs to work in the silent zone on the first floor. Oh, do you? Is it difficult to study at home then? Where do you live? I'm living in a hall of residence on campus. Oh right, it must be tough trying to study in your room. Yeah, it's pretty noisy, especially at the weekends. Are you living on campus too? Yes, I'm on campus, but there are only four people in our house, so it tends to be a bit quieter. It's at the end of the footpath, not far from the sports center. Oh right, I know where you mean. I play football on the pitch next to the sports center. I spend quite a lot of time around there. Well, next time you're in that part, let me know. You can come round for coffee. Hello. Are you new? I haven't seen you around before. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. I I just arrived. To tell you the truth, I'm a bit lost. I saw on the university website that there are lots of the different food outlets on campus, but I don't know where to find them. Oh, no problem. I can tell you all about them. There really are lots of places to eat on campus. To start with, there's the old college dining room. You can have hot meals three times a day there. If you want to start the day with a hot breakfast, that's the place to go. Okay, so whereabouts is that? It's next to the theatre, just between the bus stop and the shops. But if you're more into fast food like burgers or、um, Chinese stir fry or fried chicken, there's a huge fast food hall in the middle of the campus. Is that the big building between the students' union building and the shops? Yeah, that's right. It's a great place to meet your friends. There's always music and plenty of chat. Sounds like my kind of place. But if you just want a quiet place to have a coffee and a pastry, there's a snack bar by the lake. It has Wi-Fi and an internet cafe, and it has a spectacular view over the lake. Well, thank you very much. Can I invite you?
You will hear a conversation between two students. One of them is explaining to the other how to use the university library. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, Lily. Could you help me? You know, we've got an essay to write about eating customs across the world. Yeah, we have to borrow some books, don't we? Yes, but I missed the library training. Do you think you could show me how to find the books and how to take them out? Sure, no problem. Shall I tell you about the different parts of the library first? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Okay then. Let's look at the plan of the library. Here you can see the main door on the north side that leads into the lobby. In the middle of the building, there's a big open PC zone. The lift and stairs are on the left as you go in, and on the other side of the building, there's the library cafe. That part of the library is pretty sociable. It's a good place to study with friends. I really prefer to study alone. Is there anywhere in the library I can go? Oh, if you like studying in a quiet place, it's better to go upstairs to the silent zone. As you come out of the lift or up the stairs, you'll see a section on your right facing north, which is closed off. That's the silent zone. On the other side, facing south, are the bookshelves with all the cookbooks and. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, In the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 7. Now, can you show me how to find a book? Well, the library is very big, and the books on food could be under cookery, or they could be in history, or even entertainment. So, the first thing to do is to look it up in the online catalogue. Where do I do that? It's easy. There are lots of computers in the library for that. OK, a y I see. Right. You look up the title first. When you found the book, you'll see it has a class mark next to it. The class mark is one or two letters and a number. Make a note of the class mark. Then look it up on the plan of the library. The plan shows you exactly what section of the library the books are actually kept in. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. Thank you very much, Lily. So, how do I borrow a book? That's simple too. When you go to the library, you'll have to take your student ID card. When you want to borrow a book, you take it downstairs to the scanner. Then scan your ID card first. Next, open the book and slide it under the scanner until it makes a sound, a short beep. And that's all you have to do. Oh, sorry, I forgot. At the end, the system prints out a ticket. It's a good idea to keep it for a while, just in case you have a problem with your loan. Thanks again, Lily. You've been really kind. That is the end of section one. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. I like speaking to students, especially when there's a chance of making their lives a bit safer. Just to start, does anyone know what the most common crime is? No? Well, theft is the most common crime in the UK. There are various kinds of theft, for instance, robbery. When a thief takes something away from someone personally, like when you're walking in the street and someone grabs your handbag or your mobile and runs away, that's robbery. Another form of theft is burglary, when a thief breaks into your house and steals your property. 
OK, now I'd like to go on to talk about safety on holiday. You probably know that when you're on holiday abroad, you're in much more danger of being robbed. This is because you probably don't know the country very well. For example, you might not realise that you're in a dangerous area. One of the things you can do to protect yourself is to keep your passport and money in the safe in the hotel. You can always go back and get them if you need them. Another thing you can do is take an old mobile with you on holiday. These new smartphones are very popular with thieves all over the world. It's safer just to take an old one. Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer and I work for Campus Security. Welcome to this very short talk about emergency phone numbers. To start with, you need to know that emergency numbers aren't the same in every country. As we're in Britain at the moment, it's important to know that the emergency number is 999. So you'll need to remember this. Those of you who've been to the United States will know that the emergency number is 911, slightly different. But in Australia, the emergency number is completely different. It's 000. In Germany, the emergency number is the same as the rest of Europe. That's 112. And in case anyone's thinking of going on holiday to India this summer, it's useful to know that the emergency number there is 100. Hi everyone, this is Your Campus Radio. For all those who missed the talk on staying safe while on campus, here is another chance to listen to Dave, our very own safety officer, giving the talk. Good morning. I'm here today to give you a few tips about security on campus. We're not just here to prevent crime, but to make sure you're safe 24 hours a day. One of the services we provide for students who live on campus is to walk home with you if you need to cross the campus late at night. I mean, we all know the halls of residence are quite a long way from the library, don't we? So, for example, if you've been studying in the library till late and you're nervous about going home alone, all you have to do is ring campus security on 3333 and we'll send someone to make sure you're safe, OK? By the way, another important thing to remember is the campus emergency number. Uh, we all know the national emergency number in the UK is 999. But when you're on campus and there's an emergency, you should call 3333. If you call 3333, you'll get through to our own staff right here on campus they can react quickly and get to you faster than national services. You will hear a talk about safety in different regions. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here to talk to you about staying safe on holiday. Before I came this evening, I did a little research on where students like to go for their holidays and came up with two different regions, Latin America and India. So, um, I've been looking at the crime figures for both areas and I thought I'd start by talking a bit about that. Then I'll give you some advice about how to avoid becoming a victim of crime. OK, first of all, let's look at what kinds of crime are committed most in different regions. Um, OK, I'll start with India. Generally, India isn't thought of as a dangerous place for individuals, but there has been an increase in handbag theft in recent years. So keep an eye on your bag when you're out in the street. Right, now let's look at Latin America. Mm. Of course, you do realise that not all Latin American countries are the same, but it is true to say that guns are used in a higher percentage of crimes across the region. 
Looking at the figures, it seems that gun crime is a serious problem throughout. Before you hear the next part of the talk, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 7. Listen and answer questions 5 to 7. I can see some of you are thinking that it all sounds rather dangerous, but I know lots of people who've been there and had a really great time. They followed advice from the authorities, like making sure they didn't wear expensive jewellery in the street. And I'd certainly advise anyone travelling to Latin America to do the same. Another thing you should be careful of is not to go to lonely places at night. But of course, that's the same anywhere. But I must say, you do have to be very careful in some parts of Latin America when you take your money out of a cash machine. Sometimes you find that thieves stand very close to people at cash machines and take their money as it comes out. Before you hear the rest of the talk, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Listen and answer questions 8 to 10. OK, so now I'll finish by talking a little bit about India. I've actually been to India and I didn't have any feeling that it was dangerous at all. First of all, I went on an organised tour with a group of people. This is definitely the best way to go because it's so much safer. I mean, I didn't go anywhere without the group, and we had a tour guide who spoke the local language and knew the area. In fact, I remember now, she warned us not to go off with strangers, even if they seem nice and friendly. But again, you wouldn't do that at home either, would you? That is the end of section 2. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. 1. How many seasons does your country have? My country has four seasons. 2. What's your favourite season of the year? Summer. This is my favourite season. 3. How do rainy days make you feel? I feel very sad on rainy days. 4. What do you like doing when it's hot? I like going to the beach. I'm going to start this lecture by describing the structure of an offshore oil rig. Well, to be accurate, we should call it an oil platform. If you look at the diagram, you can see the top part of the platform floating on the surface of the water. The tall tower in the centre of the platform is called a derrick. That's D-E-R-R-I-C-K. The derrick is where the drilling machinery and lifting equipment is installed. OK? Now, if you look about halfway down the diagram on the right, you can see a helicopter. It's parked on the helicopter pad. Helicopters are used mostly to transport employees to and from the platform when they have free time. Now, if you look underneath that, at the very bottom of the platform, you can see one of the four support towers. These support the rest of the platform. These metal structures are usually attached to the seabed by long cables. Right. Now, the last part of the platform I'm going to describe is on the other side, just above the level of the water. It's a crane. That's spelt C-R-A-N-E. Cranes are used everywhere in construction. But this one is specialist equipment for lifting heavy spare parts at sea. In fact, apart from the derrick, you can see three cranes in the diagram. You will hear a lecture on deep sea exploration. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4.
Good evening. My talk this evening will cover three main themes. First, I'll outline a timeline of how deep sea exploration vessels developed. Secondly, I'll describe the most recent of these, the Deep Sea Challenger. And finally, I'll look at some of the benefits of this deep sea research. OK, to start with, let's look at how underwater exploration vehicles have developed over the years. The first manned deep sea exploration vessel was invented in the 1920s. It was called a bathysphere, better known as a diving bell. It was basically a round metal structure with windows with just enough room for two men to sit in. And it was lowered into the ocean on a cable. The first descent in the diving bell took place in 1930. And in 1934, it went down to a depth of nearly a thousand metres, which was impressive for the time. The problem with the diving bell was that it had no power of its own and there wasn't much room for the researchers to move around. So, the next development after the diving bell was the Bath Escape, a small manned submarine invented in the 1940s. The difference between the two was that the Bath Escape had its own power source, which allowed the scientists to investigate in the depths of the ocean more freely. A bathyscaphe called the Trieste reached a record depth of 10,000 metres in 1960. Since then, a new record has been set by James Cameron, who descended to a depth of 11,000 metres for the first time in 2012. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 8. Listen and answer questions 5 to 8. So let's move on now to look at the submarine that took James Cameron so far down into the ocean. If you look at the drawing of the Challenger, you can see the pilot's chamber at the very bottom of the submarine. It's a very small section where the pilot sits and controls the sub and all the equipment on it. Now let's have a look at how the submarine is powered. Going up from the pilot's chamber, in the middle of the sub, on the right-hand side of the drawing, you can see a whole section covered in batteries. They provide the power source that takes the sub all the way to the bottom of the ocean and back up to the surface again. Next to that, there's another important part of the sub. Um, you probably realise that there's no light at the bottom of the ocean, so the sub needs to take its own. If you look at the back of the sub, in the middle, just next to the batteries, you can see the panel of lights. They provide the light for filming and taking samples from the seabed. And one more part of the sub, which is important for navigation and to stop it spinning out of control, is the large fin at the back. You can see it at the back of the sub, at the top of the drawing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 9 and 10. Listen carefully and answer questions 9 and 10. OK. To conclude my talk, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. First, what is the purpose of this deep sea exploration? And second, is it worth the expense? I think one of the justifications for spending so much money on this kind of research is that it allows scientists to understand more about the surface of the Earth. For example, how it was formed and how it behaves. This could have important consequences for predicting earthquakes and saving lives through early warning systems. Another reason this type of research is considered valuable is that by exploring unknown parts of the ocean, we increase our knowledge of the availability of minerals for industry. And, obviously, this could lead to huge commercial advantages. So, the answer is yes. In the long run, this kind of exploration can benefit both the ordinary population and industry. That is the end of section 4. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Yes, yes, they are. My father and my brother studied law at university 
and they think it's a very nice subject. My mother thinks it is nice and always asks me questions about law. I have lots of friends on the course and we want to get a nice job when we graduate. Yes, yes, they are. My father and my brother studied law at university and they think it is a very important subject. My mother thinks it is interesting and always asks me questions about law. I have lots of friends on the course and we want to get a good job when we graduate. 1. No, I don't think so. Unfortunately, I think lots of changes were made to the education system last year and teachers and professors aren't happy. They want more money for the schools and universities, but the government can't give them more money. 2. Yes, definitely. I live with my family. I enjoy living at home because I can relax and just study. For example, my parents cook meals, wash my clothes and clean my room. I can spend more time studying and I think this is good. 3. My parents went to a school in my hometown. The school is a very popular one and they enjoyed it. I went to school in another country and I didn't like living away from home. My father went to university, but I don't think there were lots of universities in my country at the time. Fortunately, there are lots of universities and colleges there today. I'm visiting different universities at the moment because I'm choosing which course to study next year. 1. What are you studying now? 2. Why did you choose that subject? 3. Do you enjoy it? 4. What is the best thing about studying? 5. Are there many jobs for you after you finish studying? 1. Do you think young children enjoy going to school and learning? 2. Is it a good idea to live with your family when you are studying? 3. Compare your experience of education to your parents' generation. 4. Many people think there are benefits to studying in another country. Do you agree? 5. Do you think your country has a good education system? Hi, Martha. How's the essay going? Oh, hi, Carl. The essay, oh, you know, there is a lot of reading. It's difficult to remember all the different ideas and the different writers. So, how do you keep up with it all? Well, actually, I make a note of the writer's name and summarize their ideas in a notebook. It's very old-fashioned, isn't it? It is a bit. Actually, I'm quite the opposite. I've downloaded some free software from the internet. It lets me save all the articles and ebooks I get online and make notes on them. I like it because it's cheaper than printing everything. But what do you do, Enrique? Oh, I'm afraid my note-taking system isn't as modern as that, and it's much more expensive. I print the articles I find online, and I photocopy pages out of textbooks. Then I go through and highlight all the important information with a pen. Not very good for the environment, I'm afraid. What about you, Jenny? Um, I'm in the middle, really. I don't use special software, but I keep all the articles I read online in folders on my PC and make notes on them there. Hey, Leslie, are you ready for the exam? Hi, Chen. I haven't seen you for weeks. Am I ready? I don't know. I've been revising really hard, but I can't remember anything at the moment. 
You know, I get ready for exams by planning a revision timetable. It helps me make sure I've studied everything on time. But just before an exam, my mind goes blank. Yes, I know what you mean. I've been trying out a new technique for remembering facts and details. I heard about it in a psychology lecture. What you do is put together pictures in your mind of the different things you want to remember. It's usually better if you can make the pictures funny, like cartoons. I hadn't heard of that. It sounds like fun. Do you do that too, Indira? Well, I tried it once, but it didn't help me much. I remember things by hearing them in my head. I can't really study in the library when people are talking, because I have to be able to hear myself saying things over in my mind. It's easier for me to concentrate if I study at home, late at night when it's quieter. What do you do to remember things for exams, Mark? Mm, I go to bed early the night before the exam and get up very early in the morning, like five o'clock, and then I read over my notes again just to refresh my memory. I know a lot of lecturers tell us not to do last-minute revision, but it works well for me. Excuse me. Yes? Can I take my phone into the exam if I switch it off? Your mobile? No. No mobiles are allowed in the exam hall. You can put it in your bag, though. Okay, but then what do I do with my bag? Bags go in the lockers, down the corridor on the left. There are keys in the doors. Just lock the door and take the key with you. Over here. Look. Have a look at the poster. When you've put your things away, go to the main door of the exam hall and show the supervisor your student ID card. Oh, OK. I see. So I show my ID card at the door and then when I get into the exam hall, I need to look for my examination number. Is that the same number as my ID card? Yes, that's right. The same number. So where should I look for it? Your examination number will be on a desk. Ah, right. Thank you very much. No problem. Good luck. Hi, guys. Is everyone set to study for the exams then? Does anyone have any hints about how to get ready for them? I'm not sure where to start, really. Any ideas, Barbara? Well, Mac, there are lots of things we could do. I mean, we could start by looking at old exam papers, or we could go through all the lecture notes for each subject. What do you think? I think it's better to go through this year's lecture notes first. I mean, the exam topics might have changed since last year. Do you agree, Jerry? Yeah, I think you're right. The lecture notes will tell us what the main topics of the subject are. Do you think we could ask the tutors what the exam topics might be? I think we could ask, and they might tell us roughly what to look at, but I don't think they'll tell us exactly what the topics will be. I think it's a good idea to ask them, just to know what to focus on. So, what's next? What do you think about reading all the books on the reading list? Jerry? Uh, I don't think that's a very good idea. We can't read all the books. I think you're right. What I think we have to do is try to remember the most important details and arguments from the main writers and be ready to use them in the exam. Yeah, OK. Then the next thing to do is look at old exam papers and see what kind of questions we might get. Yes, that's where the old exams will help, looking at the type of questions. Right. So, when we've worked out which topics we need to study and remembered the main ideas, we can look at old papers and write a few practice questions. Yes, and that'll help. You will hear three students discussing exam techniques with their tutor. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Morning, everyone. I thought we'd get together today and just talk about exam techniques. I'm sure everyone has different ideas about them. So, shall we find out what you do first when you get into an exam? 
check that you have the right exam paper? <laughs> it sounds funny, but students do actually answer the wrong exam paper sometimes. So check that it's your exam first. Then what? Write your examination number on the answer sheet. Well, it might sound obvious, but writing your examination number at the beginning of the exam can be a good idea. Apart from making sure the examiner knows who wrote the exam, can anyone say why? It can help you relax? Yes, that's right. Doing something easy like that gives you a chance to calm down. Right, so what do you do next? Read the questions carefully. Well, before you read the questions, what should you do? Read the instructions. Yes, you should read the instructions next. You need to know how many questions you have to answer and whether you have to answer all the questions or only some. What other important information do you need to check before you start? How much time you have? Yes, Jerry's right. You need to make sure that you know how long the exam is so you can manage your time properly. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 8. Listen and answer questions 5 to 8. OK, what do you do next? Read the questions? Yes, it's very important to read the questions, not just once, but several times. I usually make a few notes when I'm looking at the questions. Sometimes a question looks easy, and then when you start writing, you realize that it's actually more difficult than you thought. Yeah, but you don't want to spend too much time writing notes. No, but it's a good idea to jot down a few ideas to see if you can remember the arguments for the topics you studied most. Once we've decided, is it better just to start at the beginning and answer the questions as they appear on the exam, or should we start with the easy questions? Mm, well, I start with the questions that I know better and leave the ones I'm not sure of for the end. That's what I do. But I still keep an eye on the clock, especially when the questions are all worth the same number of marks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 9 and 10. Listen and answer questions 9 and 10. Max right. If you write one very good answer, but it's only worth 30% of the marks, you still lose the other 70% on that exam. So, it's better to write our main ideas for a question, even if we don't have time to answer it properly? Yes, absolutely. We can't give you marks for writing nothing. But if you give us your main ideas, we can give you some marks. Oh, really? I wish I'd known that in my last exam. I spent all my time writing a long answer to one of the questions and didn't get round to the other two. I didn't understand why I got such a low mark. Yeah, that's what happened to me. Luckily, my tutor explained it afterwards, so I never did that again. That is the end of section three. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. One. Hi, I'm Adam. I'm your student union representative and I'm here to tell you about student societies. 2. Good morning everyone. For the last two weeks we've been looking at employment opportunities in industry and in today's lecture I'll be talking about working in a large corporation. 3. Hello, my name's Annie and I'm the University Careers Officer. Today I'm going to talk about working outdoors. 4. Is everyone ready? OK, remember last week we discussed work in private industry? Well, this week's talk will cover employment opportunities in institutions of further education. 5. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you. I'm Angus MacDonald. I'm a police officer 
and my topic today is job satisfaction. 6. Good evening. It's good to see so many people here this cold night. OK. My lecture this evening will be about finding a job. 1. Hi. My name's Adam. I'm your student union rep and this evening I'm going to talk about the different clubs you can join here at the university. 2. Hello. Thank you all for coming today. For the last couple of weeks, we've been discussing how to get a job in private industry. And today's lecture is about working in a small company. 3. Hello. My name's Annie and I'm the University Careers Officer. I've come in this evening to tell you about jobs that involve spending a lot of time outside. 4. Good evening, everyone. Right, last week we talked about working in private education. Well, this week's talk will cover employment in universities. 5. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you. I'm Angus MacDonald. I'm a police officer and today I'll be talking about job fulfilment. 6. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you. My topic for this evening will be how to find employment. I hope you'll find it useful. My name's Alice and I work on a farm in the southeast of England. Mostly we grow fruit, but we also keep chickens, ducks and dairy cows. So we have to work outside quite a lot, even in the winter when it's cold and dark. That's the worst part of the job, really. You know, having to go out in the rain and snow to feed the animals. But the summer is totally different. I really enjoy being outdoors, helping the fruit pickers and loading the trucks. We deliver most of our fruit to supermarkets, but we also supply local shops with our milk, eggs and cheese. In fact, we produce so much cheese and fruit that we even sell them directly to the public in our farm shop. I'm Wei Long, but my American friends call me Will. I'm a businessman in California. Before I came to the United States, I studied at a university in China. I graduated in information technology. But when I was young, even before I went to university, I worked in the family business. So my ambition has always been to earn a living through trade. After I graduated, I worked for my father for a few years to get some experience. And then I started my own small company. First, I set up an office in China and then I opened another office in California. We sell computer parts from China because I know a lot of people in the computer industry there. I don't have any salesmen, but I have a receptionist to look after the office while I'm out on sales trips. I like being my own boss. I enjoy being able to make all the decisions myself. I mean, I sell most of my goods to large corporations and I think I'd find it very difficult to work in a big company. You will hear a woman talking to some students about her job. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk in this series of employment lectures. I'm here this evening to tell you about my job. I'm going to tell you what I like about it, what I don't like about it, and what I hope to do in the future. OK. Well, I'm a police officer. I've been in the police for just over five years, and part of my job is to give talks to students about police work. People often ask why I joined the police, so maybe I'll start there. I've always been interested in law and order, so I went to study law at university, but uh, 
when I got there, I realised that I was more interested in the practical side of law than the theory. So I applied to work with the police force in my spare time. Then, as soon as I graduated, I was accepted for training. Before you hear the next part of the talk, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 7. Listen and answer questions 5 to 7. As you know, our job is to protect the public from criminals and defend the law. So obviously, the police force has to work every day of the week, day and night. This means we're often at work when everyone else is relaxing with friends and family, and we can't always be around for special occasions like birthdays and New Year's Eve. On top of that, we have a lot of extra work at weekends, especially when there's a football match and the fans are out celebrating. So, our working hours are one disadvantage of police work. A lot of the time we have to work with the public to avoid problems, and we get special training for that. But we can't always prevent trouble. So, another disadvantage of the job is the danger. I mean, we know that some of the people we have to arrest will attack us. Before you hear the rest of the talk, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Now for the advantages. Well, one of the advantages is that police work is well paid. As I've said, it's a difficult job and police officers work hard for their pay. But there are many more advantages. For example, sometimes the work's fun, especially when we have to protect famous people from their own fans. I've met quite a lot of celebrities in my job and I must say I enjoy seeing them close up and finding out what they're really like as people. But for me, the biggest advantage is the job satisfaction. Speaking for myself, I would say I get the most job satisfaction when I help someone or solve a problem in a community. And in the future, I'd like to train to be a detective. I think I'd be good at that. That is the end of section 4. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. That's an interesting question. Let me think. I definitely think that work experience is an important way to learn about a job. I studied business for three years and I graduated with honours. Then I got a good job but it was really hard work and tiring. I suppose that your first job is always difficult. I learnt lots in my first year there. But my course did help me. For example, I understood lots of basic points about business and finance. There are pros and cons. Work experience is an excellent way to learn about a job in real life, but education or training gives you time to learn the theories. That's interesting. Let me see. I think my parents didn't have lots of choices. They worked in their hometown or maybe the capital city. I guess that they wrote letters to apply for jobs advertised in the local newspaper. I don't think my parents' generation usually travelled for work. I'm not sure, but I can apply for jobs anywhere in the world. I look for jobs online and email application forms from my laptop, so I think it's easy for my generation. There are advantages and disadvantages, because today I have lots of different opportunities and it's sometimes difficult to make a decision. 1. In your opinion, do people work more now than in the past? 2. Do you think companies need people to travel to an office and work there, or can people work from home?
Do you have lots of close friends? 1. Do you think holidays and travelling were more important in the past? 2. In your opinion, is it a good idea for families to work together? 3. Many people think there are benefits to studying in another country. Do you agree? 4. Compare your experience of finding a job to your parents' generation. 1. When was your last holiday? 2. Do you like travelling? Why? Why not? 3. What kinds of places do you like visiting? 4. Is there a country you would like to visit? 5. Do you think tourists enjoy visiting your country? 1. Compare your experience of holidays and travelling with your parents' generation. 2. Many people think it is a good idea to go on holiday in your own country. Do you agree? 3. In your opinion, is it important to speak the language of the country you're visiting? 4. Do you think travelling with friends is a good way to travel? Hello? Hello. Is that Ali? Yes. Who's calling? Hi, Ali. It's me, Sam. Hey, Sam. How are you? When are you arriving? I'm fine. Really looking forward to seeing you. I've booked my flight for Wednesday morning, arriving at 6.50 in the evening. Great. That's Wednesday the 6th of July. And what airline are you flying on? British Airways. Flight number BA3025. BA1325? No. 3025. 3025. Ah, OK. And it gets in at 6.15, right? No, at 6.50. 10 to 7? Right. Sorry. This line's not very good. So you'll be on flight BA3025 on Wednesday the 6th, arriving at 6.50pm. That's right. Good. Well, don't worry. I'll be there to meet you at the airport. We're going to have a fantastic time. I can show you all around. 18, 13, 80, 40, 15, 1. The youngest passenger is sitting in seat 14, by the window. 2. There are 40 passengers in first class. 3. There should be 50 people on the bus. 4. Her plane arrives at 16.15. 5. Our train leaves at 17.30. 'Good evening. Fine dining. Can I help you? Hello. Uh, yes. I'd like to book a table for four on Friday evening at 8 p.m. Yes, sir. And the name is McEwen. M C E W A N. M C E 
W A N. Is that right, sir? Yes, that's right. That's booked for you, sir. Four people on Friday night at eight o'clock. Where to, madam? Westbourne Grove, please. Westbourne Grove, in the city centre. No, Westbourne, near the park. Sorry, I haven't got the postcode. No problem. How do you spell it? W e s t b o u r n e. Good morning. Taxis for you. How can I help you? Oh,、uh, good morning. I'd like to book a taxi to the airport, please. Right. And which airport is that? London Heathrow. That's fine. And when do you need the taxi for? My flight leaves from Terminal Five at seven twenty on Wednesday, the sixth of July, next week. Wednesday the sixth at seven twenty a.m. So you'll need the taxi at three thirty. Okay. Can I have your name, please? Sam Williams. And your address? Sixty, Willowside Bank, Abingdon. That's A B I N G D O N. Thank you. And the postcode is O X fourteen three H B. O X fourteen three H B. And can I have a contact number for you? Yes, of course. My mobile is o seven seven eight nine six one two seven four four. Thank you. Zero seven seven eight nine. Six one two seven four four. Now we'll be picking you up at three thirty. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Have you filled in your landing card? No, sorry, I'm having a few problems. Can I help you at all? Ah,、oh, yes, please. Well, the first question's very easy. What's your family name?、Uh, my family name is Lu, L I U. And your first name? Well, my English name is Grace, but my Chinese name is Hua Fang. Which one should I put here? Which name do you have in your passport? Hua Fang, H U A and F A. N G, so you should put that one. And your date of birth? Shall I put the day first or the month? See where it says D D M M and Y Y Y Y. Yes. What does that mean? It means date, month, and year. Oh, okay. So I put seventeen. Twelve, nineteen ninety-four. The seventeenth of December, nineteen ninety-four. Yes, that's right. And what address is this? That would be where you are staying in the UK. Ah, okay. Let me see. Thirteen Park Road, Brighton. B R I G H T O N. And the postcode B N forty four G R. Is there anything else you need help with? No, thank you. I understand the other questions. Thank you very much for your help. You will hear a telephone conversation between a hotel receptionist and a caller making a reservation. In the exam, you will have twenty seconds to look at questions one to seven. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. 
On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Silver Tulip Hotel, good afternoon. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good afternoon. I'd like to book a room for next Friday. Certainly, sir. How many nights will you be staying? Just one, please. The caller says he will be staying for just one night. So one is the answer here. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Silver Tulip Hotel, good afternoon. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good afternoon. I'd like to book a room for next Friday. Certainly, sir. How many nights will you be staying? Just one, please. And would you like a single or double room? A double room, please. A double room. And would you like twin beds or a king-size bed? A king-sized bed, please. Let me see. Yes, we do have a double room available for next Friday. Would you like me to book it for you? Yes, please. Could I have your name, please? Yes, it's Edward Francis. Is that F-R-A-N-C-E-S? No, it's F-R-A-N-C-I-S. F-R-A-N-C-I-S. Yes, that's right. And your home address, please, sir? Yes, it's 23 Cypress Avenue, Cambridge. Is that C-Y-P-R-U-S? No, C-Y-P-R-E-S-S, like the tree. Oh, I see. And your postcode is? CB39NF. And it's just for one night? Yes, that's right. We can reserve a parking space for you. Are you coming by car? Actually, I'll be taking a taxi from the station. That's fine. And one last question. Would you like dinner and breakfast? No dinner, thank you. But I'd like breakfast. Just breakfast. So, to confirm, you're arriving on Friday the 16th of April and leaving on Saturday the 17th. That's one night in a double room with a king-size bed with breakfast. That's right. Thank you very much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. And could I have your mobile number, please? Yes, it's 07976 122577. Oh, uh, no, sorry, it's been changed. It's 07961 121 597. 07961 121 597. Thank you. Is there anything else I can help you with? Yes, I'm having dinner with a friend. Could you recommend a good restaurant nearby? That would be the Winston Churchill. It's about a mile from here. Perfect. Could you please make a reservation for 7pm and leave a message with the details for my friend when he arrives? Certainly. What is the gentleman's name? Mr Aloi. That's A L A. O-U-I. No problem. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. That is the end of section one. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. OK, everyone. Could you all pay attention now? Tomorrow, 
we're going to make a popular Caribbean dish,、um, chicken and rice. Recipes vary from country to country, but for the moment, I'm going to give you the list of ingredients for the basic recipe, and leave you to add the flavors and spices to your own taste. Right? Are you ready to write this down? Okay. First of all, you need a chicken that weighs about two kilos. Then, for four people. You'll need seven hundred and fifty grams of uncooked rice. Okay, for the sauce you want half a kilo of onions. Um, and tomatoes. You'll need four hundred and fifty grams of tomatoes, and ah,、uh, and what else? Oh yes, and green peppers. You want a quarter of a kilo of green peppers, and finally, fifty milliliters of cooking oil. Have you all got that? Good. See you tomorrow then. Don't forget to bring your favourite spices. Hi, and welcome to Campus Cooking. Our daily TV program for students who want a bit of variety in their meals. Are you bored with cereal for breakfast? Well, today we're going to tell you how to make pancakes. They're cheap and quick and very easy to make. You only need flour, milk, sugar, salt, oil, and an egg. The full recipe is on the university website. Just follow the link. So here we go. Before you start, it's important to have the exact quantities, otherwise your pancakes won't cook properly. So please first make sure you weigh everything carefully. Everyone ready? Okay. Start by putting the flour, salt, and sugar into a large bowl. Next, you whisk the egg, milk, and oil in another bowl. Then, slowly add the liquid ingredients to the flour mixture, mixing well until it has a smooth, thick consistency. Make sure you stir all the time. Okay. Now we're ready to cook our pancakes. We start by heating the frying pan and greasing it lightly with a little butter. When the butter's melted, we pour a large spoonful of the pancake mixture into the pan. And cook it until the edges are brown. At this point, flip the pancake over and cook for a minute or so longer. Finally, put the pancake on a plate and cover it up to keep it warm while you make the next one. When all your pancakes are ready, you can serve them up with syrup or sugar and lemon, or even fruit. Delicious! Happy eating! Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to make apple and blackberry crumble, so I hope you've all bought your ingredients. Ready? Now let's get straight on with cooking. First, you peel the apples and cut them into slices. Okay. Don't forget to take the middle out of the apple. Now put the sliced apples in a pan and cook them with some of the sugar. In about ten minutes, they should be nice and soft, right? Now mix the blackberries and apple together. Make sure that you have about half and half. Put them into the bottom of a baking dish. That's fine. Now the next thing to do is rub the flour and butter together with your fingers until it's in tiny pieces, like breadcrumbs. Then add the sugar. When it's ready. Put the crumble mixture on top of the fruit and bake it all in the oven for thirty minutes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the university. I hope you're settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know a lot of students find it hard to adapt to the food, so I thought I'd tell you about a couple of popular English meals that you might hear about. Well, actually. 
You might have heard of the first one already. It's really popular. It's fish and chips. Fish and chips are fried in deep fat, so it's actually very greasy and not at all healthy. But it's still very popular, especially on a Friday night. That's when a lot of people get their fish and chips from the fish and chip shop and take them home to eat. Another traditional meal, which is definitely healthier, is Sunday lunch. In England, Sunday lunch is usually some kind of roast meat with vegetables. Traditionally, families have their Sunday lunch at home, but these days, quite a lot of families have Sunday lunch in a restaurant. You will hear part of an introductory talk on nutrition. In the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. Many people in the Western world eat the wrong food and they eat far too much of it. So, the topic of my lecture today is healthy eating. I'll divide my talk into three parts. Firstly, I'm going to define what I mean by healthy eating. After that, I'll go on to talk about why people don't eat properly. And then I'll finish my lecture with some ideas for improving the situation. Right. So, what do I mean by healthy eating? Well, some people might think it means eating a lot of meat. Um, of course, vegetarians wouldn't agree with this. They think eating meat is very unhealthy. Other people think that eating a lot of cabbage is good for you, or a lot of salad. Well, naturally, cabbage, salad and meat can all be part of healthy eating. But for me, healthy eating means two things. One is eating a balanced diet, and the other is eating the right amount of food. In my opinion, a balanced diet means eating a variety of foods, including meat, vegetables, fruit, cereals and dairy foods. Obviously, the amount of food we should eat is more difficult to decide. It depends a lot on how active we are. Before you hear the rest of the talk, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 7. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 7. Now on to my next point. Why do so many people eat badly? Well, let's look first at having a balanced diet. To have a balanced diet, you have to plan your meals in advance and then buy the right food. And then take time to cook it properly. But these days people are so busy working that they don't have time to go shopping. So they end up buying fast food at the last minute. Another reason people don't eat well nowadays is that it's actually cheaper to buy food already prepared in a packet. So, people who haven't got much money will buy packet food rather than cook something fresh. And a final reason why people don't eat healthily is that they don't know how to. In my opinion, schools don't do nearly enough to educate their pupils in healthy eating habits. In the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. And now to my third and last point. What can we do to solve the problem? Well, I think it can be solved by three main groups. Families, schools and the government. To start with, parents should make sure their children have a healthy diet. Secondly, a lot of schools have self-service machines where their pupils can buy soft drinks, crisps, sweets and chocolates. I think schools should change what they sell in these machines. Another thing schools can do is make sure that the food they serve in their canteens is fresh and well-balanced. 
And to finish, I'll briefly mention two of the measures I think the government should take to encourage healthy eating. One is to limit advertising unhealthy food, and the other is to spend more money on educating the public about the benefits of a healthy diet. In my next lecture, I'll go into more detail about the. That is the end of section two. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. One. Compare the differences between sports now and in the past. Two. In your opinion, do you think relaxing is an important part of being healthy? Three. How can we encourage young people to be healthy? One. Compare the differences between sports now and in the past. That's interesting. I think it's important to play sports. There are lots of different sports now, and you can learn a new sport wherever you live. Sports people earn a good salary. I think it's a good job. I'd like to be a professional golfer, but there are some boring sports. For example, I don't like watching motor racing. Two. In your opinion, do you think relaxing is an important part of being healthy? Definitely, I think relaxing is a very important part of being healthy. We are always busy. We're traveling to work or college. We're meeting friends. We're doing homework. So, in my opinion, I think it's important to slow down and relax. It is good for our bodies and our minds. Three. How can we encourage young people to be healthy? That's a difficult question. Let me see. Unfortunately, in my country, young people like playing computer games, and they usually like eating junk food. We should encourage them to play games outdoors. For example, they could go to the beach and do water sports. We should encourage them to learn about food and cook some healthy food with their families. One. In your opinion, what are the main advantages of children's games? Two. How can a school help students have healthy lives? Three. Do you think there is more opportunity to learn sports now than in the past? One. What do you like doing in your free time? Two. Do you enjoy watching sports? Three. Do you enjoy participating in any sports? Four. Which sports are most popular in your country? Five. How much time do you spend on your hobbies? One. Compare the differences between sports now and in the past. Two. In your opinion, do people in your country eat better or worse nowadays? Three. How can we encourage young people to be healthy? Four. Do you think a country's government should help people to be healthy? One. When was your last holiday? Two. What do you do? Three. What do you usually watch on TV? Four. What are you studying now? Five. Why did you choose that subject? I'd like to talk about an enjoyable event I experienced when I was at school. It happened in my senior school. And I was about fifteen or sixteen years old. There was a story writing competition in the local newspaper, and my teacher said I should enter it. I really enjoyed writing stories and poems, so I wrote a story and I entered the competition. I was very nervous, but thankfully I won. I was really surprised. It was good because I won some money and some books. 
It made me more confident about studying too. I applied for college after winning the competition. I went to the presentation ceremony in my hometown. I went with my parents and my sister. There were lots of people there and there was a photographer taking photos. It was one of the most exciting days of my life. Finally, it was enjoyable because my parents were very proud and we celebrated with a party at home. I often look at the photo from the competition. I've had the photo on my bookcase for about six years. It's very special to me. 1. Do you come from a large family? 2. Did you have a favourite teacher at school? 3. Do you have any hobbies? 4. Describe your hometown. 5. What's your experience of travelling to other countries? I'd like you to describe an important event in your life. You should say what the event was, where and when it took place, who was there at the time, and explain what made it important to you. 1. Compare how important events, like weddings, have changed compared to your parents' generation. 2. In your opinion, how should people remember important events from their country's past? 3. How do schools in your country help pupils prepare for events like sports competitions or end-of-year exams? 4. Many people think photos are the best way to remember special occasions. Do you agree? When you start university, you'll probably find it's not all that easy to balance the time you spend on studying with the time you spend going out with your friends. In fact, one of the biggest problems you'll have is managing your time. Of course, it's perfectly understandable. I mean, in many cases, it's probably the first time you'll have lived away from home, so you'll have to do lots more things for yourself, like buying your own food, washing your clothes and managing your own money. At the same time, there's no one there to tell you what time to come home at night or what time to get up in the morning. On top of that, at university, you won't have as many hours of class as you did at school and your tutors will expect you to study on your own a lot more. So you might feel you've got a lot of free time on your hands. So how do you deal with it? Well, to be honest, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I think it helps to go to all your classes, however tired you are. Print a copy of your timetable and put it on the wall in your bedroom. Actually, your university might even have a system for alerting you on your mobile when your lectures are. Apart from that, you could try not going out during the week and keeping your social life for the weekend. I'm not sure that's very easy, though. One thing I will say, though, is that at the end of the year, after your exams, you can really relax. I started this new job a couple of weeks ago, and I'm having a lot of trouble with my work-life balance. In my last job, we had fixed hours. We had to be at the office at nine on the dot, and we always finished at exactly five. Any work we hadn't finished, we could just leave for the next day. But this new job's very different. I mean, in this job, we can come into the office any time between 8 and 10 in the morning. Then we can choose whether to have a lunch break or not. Then it gets a bit complicated. Um, if we have a lunch break, we can leave between 4 and 6. If we don't have a lunch break, we can go home between 3 and 5. Okay, well at first this system sounded really good, especially for me because I have young children. But the problem is that if we haven't finished our work, we have to finish it off at home. So it's actually very difficult to draw the line between work and home. For example, 
On Mondays, I can leave the children at school, go to the gym, and get into the office quite late. But I can't take a lunch break because I need to leave early to pick the children up from school. They come out at four, and then I have to work from home in the evening to finish what I have to do. If you look at this chart, you can see how we plan our projects. This one is a survey we're working on this year about where people like to shop. OK. Well, we always start by having a team meeting. That's in the first column called tasks. So, in this team meeting, we decide what we need to do, who's going to do it and um, when it's got to be ready, right? So, you can see here in the second column, we've got the start date of the project. That's the 23rd of January. That's the same day we have the team meeting. If you look down the tasks column, you can see that the first thing we have to do is write a draft questionnaire. You know, like uh, an outline of the questions we want to ask. Then we have to check the questionnaire to make sure the questions are right. If you look at the lines in column three, you can see the dates when we have to complete important tasks in the project. These are what we call milestones in the project. For example, when we've checked the questionnaire on the 25th of April, we'll have reached a milestone. And when we've completed the survey on the 30th of June, we'll have reached another milestone. On the 15th of August, when we finish entering the data on the database, we'll have finished the first phase of the project. The second phase of the project involves writing the report. We'll be doing that between the 15th of August and the 15th of September. And that's the deadline for the project to be handed to the client. You will hear a human resources manager talking about her company's work-life balance policy. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. In our company, we believe that our employees are more productive, you know, they work better if they're happy. Naturally, we have to make sure the company makes a profit, but at the same time, we need to think about the physical and mental health of our employees. We do understand that they aren't just working machines, so we have a policy of helping them find a fair balance between their work and their private lives what we call a work-life balance. We do this in several ways. Firstly, we have a family-friendly policy, so parents can look after their children when they're very young. For example, sometimes they need to work flexible hours, you know, times that aren't fixed. Other times, parents have to work part-time, and quite a lot work from home. Another example of our family-friendly policy is our generous maternity leave package. In our company, we allow women who've had a baby to take a whole year off work after the baby's born. And of course, while they're away, their jobs are protected. Before you hear the next part of the talk, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 6 to 8. Now listen and answer questions six to eight. Because we want our employees to be happy, we carried out a survey recently to find out which working patterns are really most popular. In general, our staff prefer to work at the office. In fact, nearly half come in during regular office hours, you know, from nine to five. Anyway, we also asked about part-time work working from home, and another option, job sharing. Job sharing is a kind of part-time work where two people share the responsibilities for one full-time job. Anyway, we found that only 5% of our staff wanted to share a job, so it's not very popular on the whole. But when it comes to working part-time, we were surprised to find that 27% of our employees would actually prefer it. That's a very high number, really, over a quarter of the staff. And then it was interesting to see that quite a lot of our staff, 20% in fact, would like to work from home. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 9 and 10. Listen carefully and answer questions 9 and 10. I'd like to give you an example of the kind of person who benefits most from our family-friendly policy. Sally is one of our assistants in accounting, who has two small children. Sally's husband travels abroad a lot, so she has to look after the children on her own most of the time. Both the children go to a nursery early in the morning. So we've agreed that Sally can come in at 8 o'clock after she leaves the children. At lunchtime, Sally's sister picks the children up from the nursery. But she has to go to work herself at 3 o'clock. So Sally leaves the office at 2 to collect the children from her sisters. And she makes up the extra time by finishing her work at home. That is the end of section 2. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. Hi. This is our last lecture about business and advertising this term. And today, I am going to talk about shopping habits in different parts of the world. First, we'll look at who normally does the shopping. Yes, um, well... In the United Kingdom, about 75% of the food shopping is done by women. But this isn't the case everywhere. There are countries where up to 60% of men do the grocery shopping on their way back from work. And habits are changing, even in Western countries. For example, a recent survey showed that in the United States, nearly 50% of men shop for groceries. Now, let's look at where people shop. In fact, where people shop depends on whether they live in the city or in the country. As we all know, there are more supermarkets in the city and more markets and small shops in the country. So, as the population moves to the city to find work, more people are shopping in supermarkets than ever before. Hello. Good to see you all here. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about a recent survey into men's and women's shopping habits. Before I start, I'd like you to look at the list of statements about men and women and see which ones you would expect to be true, right? Firstly, let's look at the idea that women spend a lot of money on expensive shoes. Actually, this isn't true. In fact, women buy a lot of cheap shoes. Men, on the other hand, try to save money by buying special offers. What is surprising about women, though, is that they like shopping in expensive or exclusive boutiques. And it isn't true that they always make a shopping list when they go to the supermarket. We also expected to find that men would go to the supermarket after midnight to get their food cheaper. But this wasn't the case either. Then the third thing we learnt about women is that they like to shop in big department stores, which men don't like. They like to go shopping in specialist shops. OK, how many did you get right? You will hear the introduction to a lecture on consumer habits. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I'm going to continue last week's lecture by talking more about how people spend their money. First of all, I'm going to compare how people of different age groups spend their cash. You probably know that there's a lot of difference between what young people do with their money, how families spend their money, and what more mature people do. Secondly, I want us to think about what we imagine men and women spend their money on. And then I'm going to look at male and female spending patterns and see whether we were right. OK, to start with, let's divide the population into three sections. Let's say uh, young people up to the age of 30 in the first group. Then um, let's put families in the 30 to 55 year old group. 
So that puts adults over 55 in the mature group. Does that make sense? Before you hear the next part of the lecture, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 5 to 7. Listen and answer questions 5 to 7. Right, well, I found that the first group, that's young people up to the age of 30, mostly spend their money on clothes, music and entertainment. That's not really very surprising, is it? Although, I must admit, I thought they might spend a lot on cars and travelling around. So, the next group is what I've called families, people in the age group from 30 to 55. Naturally, as I expected, this group spends most of its money on food, toys and trips out. But I was surprised to find that people aged between 30 and 55 spend most of their money on furniture and kitchen equipment. I suppose it's logical if you think about it. People are usually improving their homes at that age and household equipment is very expensive. But they also spend a lot of money on electronic equipment like video games for the children. Now turning to the third group, that's people over 55. I thought they'd spend their money on gardening tools and electronic equipment, but I was wrong again. People in the over 55s group spend most money on new cars and days out. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, in the exam you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Listen carefully and answer questions 8 to 10. So, what did we think about how men and women spend their money? OK, well, we thought that young women would spend a lot on clothes and shoes and that young men would buy more electronic equipment and cars. Well, when we look at the figures, we can see that we were right about the men. Young men spend twice as much as women on cars and computers. But, and this is interesting, we were wrong about the women. I was surprised to find that young women spend much more on beauty treatments than they do on clothes and shoes. So we'll have to think about that again. And there's another interesting fact about young women. It looks as though young women are much more concerned about their diet than men. We found that although young women don't spend as much as men on eating out, they do spend a lot more on organic foods than young men. That is the end of section 4. In the exam, you will have half a minute to check your answers. 1. Which country are you from? 2. Which is the most popular place to go shopping in your hometown? 3. How often do you shop online? 4. When did you last buy a present for someone? 5. What do you like doing when you go out? I'd like you to describe something you own which is very important to you. You should say what it is and what it looks like, what it is made of, how long you have had it and explain why it is important to you. 1. In your opinion, do possessions make people happy? 2. Compare the important possessions you have with the important possessions your parents have. 3. Many people think that shopping is a good way to relax. Do you agree? 4. Is it better to receive a present or to give a present? You will hear a number of different recordings and will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the questions and instructions and you will have a chance to check your answers. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. 
Section 1. You will hear a customer calling a travel agent to book a holiday. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You will see that there's an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation related to this will be played first. Hello, Travelwide, can I help you? Oh yes, good morning. I'm looking for a hotel for a long weekend. The caller says that he is looking for a hotel for a long weekend. So the answer is C, a few days. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello, Travelwide, can I help you? Oh yes, good morning. I'm looking for a hotel for a long weekend. OK. First of all, um, where would you like to stay? I mean, are you looking for a peaceful weekend in the country, a busy city break or a relaxing time at the beach? Well, I certainly want a quiet weekend. I work very hard, so I'd like to relax for a few days. Right, so it would be country or beach. Which would you prefer? Mm, the beach is very relaxing, but... I think I'd rather go to the country this time. OK, that's fine. Let me have a look at country hotels. Would you like to stay at a spa hotel where you could swim, read, eat healthy food and have relaxing treatments? Or would you prefer a family hotel on a farm? Uh, I must say I like the idea of a spa. Well, that's great. Now, let's just look at our spa hotels. Mm, you definitely don't want the beach. No, I'd like to go somewhere in the countryside, somewhere where I can go for walks. OK, then it won't be the Ocean Waves Resort. Farmhouse Getaways is a family-run hotel in the country, but it's not a spa. How does Sparkling Spring sound? It's a luxury spa hotel in the countryside, with an indoor heated pool and views over the fields and woods nearby. That sounds exactly what I'm looking for. Let's go for that. Excellent. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 7. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 7. Now, if I can take some details, I can make the booking for you. Could I have your full name, please? Yep. My name's William French. William French. And your address? Number 4, The Willows. Stan March, Norfolk, any one four SP. The Willows. Sorry, how do you spell that? W I double L O W S. The Willows. Thank you. And can I have a contact number for you? Yes, my mobile's probably the best one. It's O seven six three two double one double two five four. O seven six three two double one double two five O. No, it's 07632 112254. Sorry, 54. And when would you like to go? On the weekend of the 15th of June. Fine. Checking in on the 15th of June. And when would you like to check out? I'd like to stay until the night of Monday the 18th of June, so I'd be leaving on Tuesday the 19th. Right. Check out on Tuesday the 19th of June. And how will you be paying? By credit card. How much will it be? Ah, uh, let me see. Four nights at £90 per night is £360. Is that OK? It includes breakfast and dinner and a treatment a day. Yes, that sounds fine. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Would you like me to tell you how to get to the hotel once you're in the village? It's a bit difficult to find. Oh, yes please. I have maps on my mobile phone, but there isn't always a signal. 
Okay, well, coming into the village from the motorway, which is in the east, the first building you see on your right is the church. It's right opposite the garden centre. Okay, the church is on my right and the garden centre on my left. Yes. Just after that, you'll come to the railway crossing and then you'll see the river on your left. After that on the right, you'll see the school. It's just before the bridge, over the river. So the school's before the bridge? Yes, that's right. Now, just after the bridge, you'll see a turning on your left. Take that and follow the road through the fields. On your left, between the road and the river, you'll see a lot of vegetable gardens. Just keep going down the road to the end. It leads straight into the car park at the spa. You can't miss it. It's at the end of the road. Thank you very much for your help. My pleasure. I hope you have a lovely weekend. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Good morning. Welcome to the Science Museum. There's so much to do here. You could spend all day going from one exhibition to another. But if your time is limited, I'd suggest choosing maybe just one main exhibition. At the moment, I suggest that you don't miss our new exhibition of everyday inventions. It's amazing to see how objects we use in our daily lives, like paper clips, tea bags and light bulbs were invented in the first place and how they've developed over the years into such an essential part of our lives that we hardly ever notice them. You shouldn't miss it. The other thing I'd suggest if you don't have much time is a guided tour of the free exhibitions. These tours usually start on the hour, at one o'clock, two o'clock and so on. They're quite short, only half an hour, so you could do a couple of tours in an afternoon if you wanted to. If you'd like to go on a tour, you should go to the entrance of the exhibition on the ground floor and wait for the guide there. Before you hear the next part of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 17. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 17. Just to give you an idea of the range of exhibitions we have here at the museum, I'm going to tell you about the exhibitions and activities we have for visitors of different ages. First of all, for the little ones, we have a fascinating area called Shapes and Patterns, where they can play with objects and images and see how they form different patterns. It's really colourful and exciting. Kids love it. Then, at the other end of the scale, we have more complex exhibitions that appeal more to our older visitors. There's one about the history of aviation, how planes developed over the years. Older visitors may even be able to remember some of the earlier planes on display. Another exhibition that adults might particularly enjoy is the Energy Exhibition. It shows the historical development of different forms of energy in Britain and how it has powered industry over the centuries. And of course, we mustn't forget the teenagers. There are lots of exhibitions to interest them, but my favourite one is the one where visitors can find out more about how physics works. It's a fun exhibition with plenty of hands-on activities that explore how light and heat and chemicals work. I still go there myself now and then. It's brilliant. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Most of our exhibitions are free, but you will need a ticket for some of the special ones, like the 3D film shows. So let me explain how you get a ticket online. Of course, you can do this directly at the ticket office, but if there's a long queue, you can book online on your mobile. So, go to our homepage and choose the Events button. Then, click on the film title. That'll take you to the next window. In the right-hand corner, you'll see a little calendar. Choose the date on the calendar and then go to the next window. 
There's a drop-down box there for you to choose the time and another one for the number of tickets. Careful on that page. There are different prices for adults and children. When you've done that, go to the final page and choose your payment method. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear two students and their tutor discussing a survey project. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. So, what's the survey about, Tom? It's about where students want to live and how they choose. Basically, their accommodation preferences. We've actually tried it out with a few students already. OK, that sounds fine. So, to start with, how many questions have you got? Hmm, 20? Is that too many? Yes, it is, really. People get fed up answering lots of questions and they stop thinking about their answers. Right, so we need to think about that again. What do you think of the first three questions? Uh, you want to know what affects students' choice of accommodation when they go to university? Yes. We want to find out which has the most effect. The cost, the number of rooms in the house or flat, or the distance from campus. And then we asked another question. Oh, yes. What else did you want to find out? Well, we wondered whether public transport was important. You know, not many students have cars, so it might be quite important for them to be near somewhere where they could catch a bus or train. Yeah, that's a good question. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 26. Before you ask any more people, I've got a couple of suggestions for improving the questionnaire. First of all, I think you need to ask fewer questions. As I said, 20 is really too many. I'd cut it down to 10 if I were you. OK, 10 questions only. And is there anything else you think we should do? Well, yes. Some of the questions are actually quite complicated. I think you should make them clearer. I mean, I think they should be easier to understand. And what do you think about asking more questions about cost? No, I don't think you need any more about cost. But you could ask a couple more questions about the reasons for students' decisions. So we should ask some more questions with why? Yes, I think you'd get quite a lot more information if you did that. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Um, we've already got some results from our first questionnaire. Do you think we could use them? I don't see why not. What have you found out so far? Well, the number of rooms was only important for 16% of the people we asked. It looks like a lot of students are quite happy to share a room. And even fewer people were concerned about being near a bus stop. Only 10% in fact. I'm surprised about that. But what about the distance from the university? Well, that was quite important. Around 20% of the students we asked wanted to be close to campus. Hmm, that makes sense. And what about the cost? <laughs> yeah, as we expected, the cost was by far the most important factor. More than half the students were concerned with the cost, 54% to be exact. Only 54%? I thought it would be closer to 80%. That is the end of section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a lecture on bird migration. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 34. My lecture this evening will focus on the migration of birds. That is, how birds fly in big groups from different parts of the world at certain times of the year. In the first part of the lecture, I'll talk about the reasons why birds migrate, when they migrate, 
and which parts of the world they migrate from and to. To start with, why do birds migrate? Well, there are two main reasons. One, they migrate to look for food, and two, they travel to parts of the world that are more suitable for breeding. In fact, these reasons are closely linked. As you can imagine, when birds are breeding, they need extra food to feed their young. And in the spring, in the cooler climates of Europe, there is a lot of food for birds, especially insects. So generally, during the spring, birds fly up from the tropics, which are hot, to cooler climates in the north. They stay there for a few months to bring up their young. And then, when the weather in the north gets cold in the winter, they fly back to warmer climates in the south. Before you hear the next part of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 35 to 37. Now listen and answer questions 35 to 37. Now I'd like to talk a bit about how global warming has affected bird migration. One of the effects of global warming has been to make the spring come earlier in the northern regions of the world. When spring comes early, the plants and insects that birds need to bring up their young are also available earlier. Research has shown that quite a lot of birds have started to migrate earlier because of higher temperatures. But unfortunately for some species, this hasn't been early enough. What I'm saying is that birds that are travelling a long way for breeding may arrive too late to find enough food to feed their young and their population drops drastically. Scientists are currently researching more about this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 38 to 40. Now, I thought I'd finish by just briefly describing a few different patterns of migration. Uh, migration varies with the type of bird and the area they come from. For example, one kind of migration is partial migration. This means that some birds in a particular species will migrate and others won't. It usually depends on how the weather affects food supplies and very often happens in the tropics. In another migratory pattern, a bird called an arctic tern migrates the whole length of the globe from the North Pole to the South. The Arctic Tern travels between 12 and 15,000 kilometres each way when it migrates in a complete circle around the world. It's quite amazing. Right, and lastly, I'd like to mention a pattern which isn't nearly as spectacular, but is very interesting. And this is the way many birds migrate across North America. In this pattern, the birds fly northwards in the west of the country and then back south again in the east. So, if you imagine it, they're actually migrating in a circular pattern, like the hands of a clock, not in a straight line, as we might think. That is the end of the listening test. You now have some time to check your answers. Good morning. My name is Katie Green. Can you tell me your full name, please? Thank you. Can I see your identification, please? Thank you. That's fine. Now I'd like to ask you some questions about yourself. Do you work or are you a student? Do you have a large family? Describe your hometown. What's the weather like in your country? What are some of your hobbies? Now I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. Before you talk, you'll have one minute to think about what you're going to say. You can make some notes if you wish. Do you understand? I'd like you to describe a person who helped you. You should say where you met the person what relationship this person was to you, what was special about them, and explain how this person helped you. Would you like to help someone in this way? We've been talking about a person who you admire 
And now I'd like to ask you some more general questions about people. Do you think we can learn anything from older generations? Compare the role of the family in today's world to the past. Should we ask our family for help or should we try being independent? In your opinion, 